I'd like to welcome you into this oil painting video where we will be discussing and looking at the journey between the multitude of different brush sizes that you can use. So in this case, we're going to be working from the large brushes down to the tiny brushes. And here's our model Mo, and I'm going to keep an image of him to the top left corner of your screen so you can refer to it as the painting develops. All right, for our palette today, we're going to be using Zinc White, Burnt Umber, Alizarin Crimson Permanent, Cadmium Red, Yellow Ochre, Sap Green, Ultramarine Blue, and Ivory Black. And the canvas that we'll be working on is an 11 by 14 inch cotton canvas toned with Burnt Umber oil paint. And of course, that tone was allowed to dry over a week or so. And if at any point in this video you become curious as to what materials I'm using as to the uh, brands of the oil paints and the brushes and all of that, uh, you can go ahead and scroll down to the description box below and I'll have all of that information typed up for you. This approach is going to be kind of a classic. If you've seen my uh, older videos where I started off with a drawing brush and a drawing color, do you remember those? Alright, so this is what we're going to be doing. So I'm using Burnt Umber and a size 2 filbert bristle brush but this is actually a bristle synthetic mix the brush is actually called master's touch 6 now i don't know why they changed the size but in any case this is a size 2 filbert brush that i'm using as my drawing brush and so i'm going to start off with the uh, general envelope so i'm trying to figure out where i want to place our model onto the surface of the canvas and this is much easier to do with a transfer drawing I will say but if you're going to want to work very quickly if speed is what you're after uh, then working in this fashion with the drawing brush will get you there much faster so we're going to start to just look at the outside shape so remember this is called an envelope uh, you can almost imagine it as taking a little bit of uh, chalk and tracing all the way around the model. And we're using straight lines and angles. And the reason we're using straight lines and angles is because it's much easier to understand them. A straight line is much more uh, easy to understand its beginning and its end and its middle than, say, a curve. Uh, so now let's look at the top of the head. So I'm looking at the top of the head and I notice it's going off the screen. So I'm actually going to go ahead in a little bit and bring that shape down. But first I'm just looking at the overall general placement of the uh, figure into the canvas. And you don't always have to work the same way. Uh, now I will say traditionally it's much easier to do a drawing on a separate sheet of paper and transfer it and you're gonna do the same exact thing so sometimes you might just want to jump in there uh, with a drawing brush and just work things out with the drawing brush and so I just moved the top of the head a little bit further down and at this stage the painting is very fluid and by fluid I mean it's very easy to move all of these shapes are extremely versatile. Nothing is set in stone. Notice we're using a little bit of uh, paper towel as our eraser. The paper towel has the tiniest bit of odorless mineral spirits on it. Very tiny amount of it. I want to say even maybe a couple drops of mineral spirits towards the, the end of the paper towel. And I should say the paper towel that you use... Uh, it's kind of important. I will say that I really like to use uh, Viva brand paper towels, the ones that are like cloth. So Viva, that is V-I-V-A. All right, so now we're trying to indicate the placement of the shoulders a little bit more accurately now. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, remember I said that the start is very fluid, uh, very malleable we can easily move these shapes and and that's where you want to be you want to be able to have a little bit of freedom with your shapes so now I'm moving the shoulder a little bit down and now I'm looking at the shape of the hand and so let's just like we would in a drawing let's consider this stage the where does stuff fit 
phase. So I'm just trying to test out the water, so to speak. Just trying to figure out where everything is going to fit in general and then make them more and more specific. So now we have a little line there for the arm. So I tell you what, what I'm trying to do is place the head a little bit further to the right. A little bit further to the right and to the top of the canvas. And I'm trying to crop the arm such that I don't crop it at the joint. I definitely don't want to crop the arm right at the elbow. So that's what I'm trying to do as far as placement is concerned. And so now let's get into a little bit more specificity onto the shape of the head. Now I'm still trying to work out that envelope. Notice we're using our uh, paper towel eraser. Now let's go ahead and etch in a uh, rectangular shape there for the axes of the eyebrows and the axes of the eyes. Just a simple rectangular shape. And again, nothing has to be set in stone here. I'm just trying to figure out, I'm just trying to get an idea of where things are going to fit. And now we have a little angle there for the eye socket to the left of your screen. And so we're just making a simple little triangular looking shape there for the eye socket. And so you want to think about what the model is doing. What the model is doing. So you're drawing what the model is doing and not the model. So don't think about drawing the model. Think about drawing the pose. All right, so our model is turned almost in profile. Our model is in three quarter, but almost in profile. So that's why I'm starting off with these little corners right here. So this might be the bottom of the uh, mandible, and here's the side of the uh, the side of the orbicularis oris, meaning just the side of the shape that contains the mouth. Side of the nose, very easily indicated there with a simple straight line. And here's the uh, axis mark for the bottom of the nose. So I'm really trying to articulate the turn that the model is making in relation to me. And I'm trying to keep my marks uh, very minimalistic in nature. So I don't want to have too many shapes going on at once because that might be more difficult to move in the case that I have to move something. So now I'm drawing in, I just drew in a little shape there for the ear and let's make a little horizontal gesture there for the ear and let's say that the ear goes around there all right so now let's take a look at the distance now so the top of the head to the finger so that's a vertical horizontally that should match up with the corner of the eye socket and the back of the head and that actually fits so we're in a, a good position here for the placement of the head now let's go ahead and move on into the uh, a little bit more of the smaller shapes for the face. So try to work out the general shape of the eye socket within the outside shape of the head before placing in the eyes. Not always the case. You've seen me, if you've seen my previous videos, I kind of, I'm kind of an explorer when it comes to uh, different techniques and ways of creating paintings. So. In this technique, we're going to focus on the eye socket itself without placing in the eyes right away. And I will say, try to, if you're working in this way, try to hold the brush all the way the furthest distance back as you can and try to stay a little bit further back uh, when you're making these shapes. Because when you're working with big shapes, it's easier to be further back than it is to be closer up to the image. All right, so now let's go ahead and put in the little corner where the uh, eye socket rolls into the front of the eyelid forming the upper eyelid but we're actually going to just leave it as a simple line for now and that big brush right there is a pretty used up uh, I think it's a size 6 bristle brush and it's a dry brush and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just using it to uh, push the paint a little bit and make a little more refined edge with it now you can do that with paper towel as well. All right, so now we have the bottom of the uh, eyelid to the left of your screen, and here's the top of the eyelid fitting within the structure of that eye socket shape that we placed in there. So remember, first it was the shape of the eye socket. And now we're going in there and placing the uh, upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. I'm very much thinking of a uh, 
kind of like a sculpture. I'm keeping this kind of in a sculptural feel as opposed to thinking of just uh, simply outlining the features. So let's look at the bottom of the nose here. So that would be about the root of the nose. So I went ahead and uh, subtracted some of the paint on the bottom. Now let's take a look here. Let's make a little vertical movement here. So the nostril, I'm relating it vertically to the corner of the eye to the left. Let's go ahead and subtract a little bit more from the side of the nose here and a little bit more on the contour. When you're working with a profile or a pose that's very close to profile, I think you really want to focus on that outside edge. That outside edge can be very tricky, especially when you have a turn that's extremely close to profile. Here's the side of the orbicularis oris, and now we're starting to work our way towards the mouth. And just a simple little mark there for the mouth, and now we have the side of the mouth and the bottom shape of the mouth. Still very much using straight lines and angles, but the key here is to be as specific as you can with the least amount of information as you can. Easier said than done, I know, but we're trying to work out the shapes in such a way that everything is relating to one another. Here, let's make a little horizontal gesture. And now we have a little place marker there for the cheekbone. So that is the zygomatic bone. And let's work our way across the ramus of the jaw right about there. We're going to have a little swoop there. Remember the ramus of the jaw is the little, just a little turn that the jaw makes as uh, it approaches the little shape of the ear there. And now let's just uh, look at the bottom placement of the ear. And right about there, I'm going to just do this by eye, but later on I'll come back with a horizontal line. Alright, so now with a T-square, we're looking at a horizontal line between the eyes to try to gauge the angle between the eyes. So the eyes aren't horizontal, in fact they're kind of angled in this fashion. A very slight angle in this uh in this direction. So let's go ahead and make a little mark here again with our drawing color, our burnt umber drawing color. And if you've seen my past few videos where I first created a drawing, this is the same kind of thinking that I used for the drawing. Now the angle of the eyes, in my opinion, is the most important angle. Now let's go ahead and look at the tear duct to the eye on the right of your screen. So the little mark we made right there, that is the tear duct. And here is the corner of the side of the eye as the eyeball wraps around and seeks refuge within uh, the eyelids turning into the eye socket. And we can describe all of these forms in a very simple manner. So we're thinking three-dimensionally with those uh, simple straight lines and angles but we're also making these uh, marks as uh, minimalistic as possible now we're going to follow through to the other eye uh, we're going to just place in the the uh, iris and now let's go ahead and get our little caliper. So let's look at the distance from the tear duct to the corner of the eye and relate that all the way across. And that distance, so the tear duct to the corner of the eye should be a little bit longer. Remember that the model is in profile. So let's go ahead and make that measurement again after just making this little tiny correction. So okay, you'll see what I'm talking about. Let's get the caliper. All right, so this distance here should be a little bit wider. See how it overlaps and approaches the other eye? All right, let's do that again. See how it overlaps? That's how you get specificity within the eyes. Make sure the angle is right. Make sure the distance between the eyes is correct. And that's all there really is to it. Now let's look at the corner of the side of the eye socket and make a vertical using our T-square. And we're going to notice that the side of the mouth right here, so this corner of the mouth, is actually going to go further left on a vertical. All right, so now we have our simple uh, 
but accurate block in using our drawing color. Now remember this video is big brush, little brush, or little brush, big brush, however you want to think about it. So we're going to start off with a big brush. So we're using a size 6 flat bristle brush. The only reason I have a flat brush is because this brush was on sale so I had to get that brush so it is a size 6 flat bristle brush and I'm gonna go ahead and fill in the background with the zinc white ultramarine blue a tad bit of sap green and a touch of yellow ochre and a little secret here is that I did not I did not use any medium I didn't use any medium uh, for the paint that I used to fill in the background. Now the drawing color, I used a tiny bit of mineral spirits for the burnt umber uh, when I drew the uh, the block in. But the background, I didn't use medium, and I'll tell you why. When you're working on a cotton canvas that doesn't have a very smooth finish, uh, when you use a bit of mineral spirits or medium so that is when you thin out the paint it tends to glare and so the background I I'm tired of backgrounds that glare all the time so uh, I went ahead and didn't use any medium and I used much more paint into the background because I don't want the background to glare. Now it's a light value so it may look like it's glaring but it's it's not glaring it's just a light value. Alright so we're just adjusting some little fine marks here for the shoulder and again in terms of composition I want the shoulder here to uh, be a little bit further to the right so I'm using my little paper towel eraser there to uh, make those adjustments. Now let's get into some flesh tones. So making a, a mixture of cadmium red, sap green, a little bit of yellow ochre, and some burnt umber is going to give me a nice little uh, neutral flesh tone to work with. And remember big brush, little brush. So we're starting off with a size 6 bristle flat brush size 6 bristle flat brush and we're starting off with these darker planes so these planes that are angling away from the light so what's a plane so a plane is a three-dimensional construct of a flat sheet in space imagine you have a kite flying across the Sun that kite is forming a plane in relation to the Sun and as the kite moves around depending on how reflective it is that kite will look brighter or darker depending on its angle in relation to the sun. And so that's how you can think about plane changes. So the plane changes that are lighter, such as this one, are the planes that are moving or angling closer to the light. So now it's a little bit of ivory black, some sap green, and a tiny bit of our, uh, I want to say, alizarin crimson permanent. And so let's paint in a dark flat plane here for the corner of the side of the head. And I'll tell you why I'm doing this. So I'm doing this because I want to create a subtle transition from light to dark as the planes of the head start turning away uh, from the side of us. And so especially with a profile view like this, the way that you describe the transitions between the values from light to dark as you approach the side of the head is going to be really important in describing the three-dimensionality of the uh, image. So we're starting off with a flat darker shape than we need then we're going to cut back in uh, shortly with some lighter planes and go right into that dark passage. So now we're doing that actually so we're cutting right we're going to cut right into that shape but first here's the side of the uh, the temporal region of the the head so here's the forehead so the uh, frontalis of the head and now we're working our way towards this little shape here this is the frontal ridge of the skull you can see it very pronounced on our model so we have the frontal ridge of the skull protruding out and a little bit of uh, 
yellow ochre and some of our zinc white. And so the reason I'm using zinc white is because zinc white is a transparent white which allows me to use more of it. And if you've seen my previous videos, you know that I love using lead white. Uh, but for some reason, my lead white is drying extremely fast on me. I don't know why. I think maybe the uh, cap, the top of the cap is broken or something. I'm not sure. But if you have any uh, ideas as to why my lead white is drying super fast, uh, just go ahead and let me know in the comments and let other people know why that kind of thing could happen. At any rate, now we're going to go on to the lighter region of the palette. And if you notice the flesh tones on the palette, so that was a combination right there of cadmium red, yellow ochre, and zinc white on top of the colors we already had. So if you'll notice the palette it has a transition of value now. So the top end of the palette is lighter, the middle is middle tone, the bottom is darker. So again with our large brush here we're starting to put in some plain changes here so this is going to be the side of the uh, zygomatic region. And a little, um, a little trick here we're trying to build the plane changes, but we're not trying to match each color exactly. I'm much more focused on the value than I am with color. And that is because color can always be changed. Color can all, you can always put a glaze over it after this dries. You can always adjust the color wet on wet, which is what we will do in this case. But for the majority of the mixtures on the palette I'm much more focused on the tonality of the image plus I've also been told I have a tendency to make colors a little too hot so I'm trying to contrast that tendency uh, by making the colors a little bit more in the uh, middle ground so now let's add in a little more cadmium red a little more cadmium red into the side of the cheek there a little corner little plane right about there it's getting a little bit darker but the idea is to cover the surface and this is also referred to as large form modeling so again we're thinking about the planes and their angle with respect to the light as we paint in these planes so here we're just uh, painting in the little edge there for the top of the nasal bone and now let's go to the darker region of the palette and let's paint in this little dark value, this plain change as the uh, muzzle of the mouth uh, turns away from the light. Here we have the bottom of the lower lip as we work our way towards the bottom of the orbicularis oris. There we have, remember the orbicularis oris is just the shape that surrounds and encompasses the mouth. The muzzle of the mouth is kind of just a uh, conceptualization of the mouth being contained within the little cylinder so that's all that muzzle means and now we have the little uh, a little bit of warmth let's throw in some warmth with the uh, cadmium red mixed onto the middle region of the palette uh, for the cheekbone the zygomaticus major and minor are the muscles surrounding the side of the face across the cheekbone or you can say over top of the cheekbone and so you can really see that on the model here and it's that highlight that we're painting in right now and that's that's due to a muscle so our model is fairly fit and he's got muscles even on his face you can kind of see the little strand of a uh, plane change and you can even see still some of the zinc white showing on the uh, on the cheekbone here all right so now a little bit of a lizard and crimson permanent into the middle region of the palette and it's important to know the nature of your colors a lizard and crimson and a lizard and crimson permanent are very good red ish colors they're very deep red ish colors that you can use to tint something red ish so that's why I use it to tint colors red ish so now we have the bottom of the mandible a simple combination of our alizarin uh, crimson and ivory black to again add a little bit more warmth to that color because it's a little too green so let's add a little more warmth into that cast shadow from the finger and now we have 
very simple little shape here that we're going to put in for the dark mass. So coincidentally, flat brushes are actually really good at these at sculpting out these large planes, especially large flat brushes. Now maybe that's what I should have told you why I was using them, but I am using those large flat brushes because they were on sale. But flat brushes, again, are actually very very useful for creating plane changes. And now we've just switched out to an awkward looking brush. This is a size 6 Egbert, it's called. So I'm using it just because I needed another big brush that was clean and I didn't feel like cleaning my other brush. So here we have the lighter plane. So we're using this to paint in some lighter planes and just added in a large band of highlight. And now we're going to go in and paint in the bottom lip, a little bit of the mid-tone region of the palette. And let's take the little bit of a darker tone now to put in the accent between the upper lip and the lower lip. And it's it's kind of fun to see all of these large uh, mounds of paint, these large shapes of paint, and develop the painting in this way. Again, you don't always have to work in this way. You could take your time with a small brush and figure out each individual little shape. That's also a lot of fun too. So now we have the little side of the uh, dark light of the nose. So that flat plane was for the dark light of the nose. And the dark light is the value in the light just as light approaches shadow. That's what a dark light is. Now let's get into the halftone region of the palette and put in the bottom shape of the orbicularis oris. You can see that shape very pronounced on our model. Again, our model is very muscular. Even his face has muscles. Very awesome looking. So now we have the bottom of the orbicularis oris and we're distinguishing it from the top plane of the upper lip. You can very easily see all of these plane changes now and Again, using these flat brushes coincidentally is actually helping out with these uh, large plane changes. Now let's add a little bit more cadmium red onto the middle tone region of the palette and add a little bit more yellow ochre. And I will say that I'm dry brushing uh, these colors, so I didn't use any medium. I'm not using any medium yet. This is just the oil paint. But I will transition to using medium as I create more subtlety into the plane changes. All right, now we're going to paint in the plane change now for the bottom of the side of the neck. So here we have the side of the neck. It's actually a little bit darker than, say, the uh, top plane of the cheekbone. And it's even going to be darker here as we roll across the back side of the skull. So the back side of the head is right about here. So we got to make sure to uh, indicate the back of the skull. And we did that with a very quick and simple brush stroke. But I will say, uh, if you're drawing or painting someone where you can very clearly see the back side of their head, make sure that you uh, look at an image of a skull itself on the side just to make sure you give the model the uh, shape for the back of their head. And now with a completely different brush with our ultramarine blue, ivory black, and a little bit of sap green and a touch of yellow ochre, we're going to paint in the dark shape for the shirt. And now I'm very closely following the uh, outline of the side of the shoulder. And if you notice, we switched brushes here. So we're using a different brush to fill in this large mass for the shirt. Um, so when you're working big brush, little brush, or basically with large shapes of color like this, you're going to want to have a lot of brushes uh, readily available for you. It's kind of like an army of brushes. All of the brushes are working together. Each one of them has their own task and they all communicate to one another when they need to be used. Now then, let's look at the side of the shirt right about here. Let's make a single little brush stroke for that. And let's just look at the shape of the shoulder again. So let's just reevaluate that angle. Now, I'm not trying to copy the photograph, but I am looking at the angle uh, that the shoulder is making, and I'm trying to get that angle as correct 
as possible. Now the shoulder to the right is a little bit higher, so the one to the right of your screen is a little bit higher than the shoulder to the left of your screen, and that's because uh, he's resting on his arm on his knee. Remember, your shoulders can move. Uh, you can move your shoulders independently of one another, so at this point you can definitely tell that uh, the shoulder to the left of your screen, so that is his shoulder, is angled because his arm is resting on his knee even though you can't see his knee. Alright so now we have a little half down there for the side of the thumb. So now we're going to get into painting the hand. So this painting will also include a hand. So we're going to look at the uh, wrist, so the radius and ulna connecting to the bones for the fingers and now we have the little knuckles, so the shape of the knuckles and the thumb. So it's important to figure out the relationship between the knuckles, the wrist bone, and the thumb. Because if you can figure those relationships out, then uh, figuring out the rest of the hand is only a matter of adjusting your smaller shapes in relation to, again, the wrist bone, the knuckles, and the thumb. Alright, so a little bit more cadmium red and a tiny bit of our yellow ochre and some burnt umber and a ton of zinc white perhaps a little too much zinc white but it's okay now we're painting in the uh, little angle changes for the bones and those bones are the there you have it little plain chains right there so that is a plain change for the metacarpal bones and those metacarpal bones are working their way all the way up here across the knuckle and into the bones of the fingers, that is the phalanges. And yes, I had to Google these terms. So don't worry if you don't know every little uh, intricate thing about the anatomy or human anatomy. It's a learning process. So I learned what the metacarpal bones are as they approach uh, the fingers. Now I'm sure I must have learned this in school at some point, but you know how we forget things and now we have the little top of the finger a simple little plane change for the top of the finger and with the fingers especially when you can see a very protruding finger you really want to think about it in terms of plane changes uh, because if you round it out too quickly it can lose its form and not look uh, like the finger is turning alright so now we have a little plane change uh, for the little side of the middle finger so that that should be the middle finger and another little trick here when you're uh, drawing or painting hands don't think about individual fingers that is don't worry about having to count the fingers uh, don't worry about that at all just focus on the uh, general shape of the hand and the anatomy will be built on top of it and trust me you won't have an extra finger there it'll be fine now we have the uh, little plane change there for the last metacarpal region right about here and so again we're using a large brush for this so this is a large size 6 kind of awkward brush this is an Egbert brush so now a little more zinc white and a tiny bit more of the uh, cadmium red that we had on this brush and now we have a little light there for the pinky and again don't think about the individual fingers think about the large picture think about the accent mark that creates the pinky don't think about the little outline around the pinky instead think about the accent mark and that's not always the case sometimes you want to go in there and draw the outline and that's okay as long as you're keeping track of your shapes and relating them to one another. So now let's look at this little shape here as it rolls around the palm of the hand and let's just make sure that the shape for the palm of the hand is uh, matching up with the fingers. So let's go ahead and go down the bottom of the wrist. So here we have the little wrist bone, the radius and ulna connecting over here and I don't know I don't know a terrible amount of anatomy I know shape and I know basic bony landmarks such as the uh, basically the wrist bone, the joint for the thumb, 
and the knuckles. Again, remember the wrist bone, the knuckles, and the thumb are the things that you really want to focus on for the hand. All right, so now let's combine our zinc white, ivory black, and a tad bit of flesh tone. And let's go ahead and paint in the white of the eye, also known as the sclera. So now we're painting in the sclera. And remember that the sclera is not white. Even if it looks white on your photo reference, or even if it looks white on uh, if you're working from life, it's not. It's not bright white. And that's why we used a little bit of ivory black to bring in a kind of a neutral blue. Remember, ivory black is kind of a neutral blue. And a little bit of flesh tone just so it's not overly cold. And now with the sclera of the eye, the sclera, you really want to make it a little more on the cooler side, if you know what I mean. You certainly don't want to go pinkish uh, with this color. Now a little bit of ultramarine blue and some burnt umber, a alizarin crimson, and a little bit of sap green, some yellow ochre, back to the alizarin crimson permanent. Remember, alizarin crimson and sap green are like two colors that were made for each other. And so now we're going to go ahead and reevaluate the planes that we painted earlier. So we can tell that this plane needs to get a little bit darker as it turns around the side of the face. And uh, the value range in the lights are pretty uh, drastic. They're, they change a little bit more frequently, and I think it might have to do uh, with the position of the light. The light's pretty much uh, facing his cheekbone, so it's very much almost frontal lighting. So that's why there's such a drastic gradation of tone as you uh, move from, say, the middle of the forehead all the way around to the side of the back of the skull. So now we just painted in a, a little bit more of a dark accent there for the bottom of the lower eye socket. And now let's go back to the middle tone of the palette, and let's just uh, go ahead and reinforce the uh, nasal bone. And now we're working our way to the side plane of the forehead. We're working our way around the forehead. Here's the bulb of the forehead. Now with a little more alizarin crimson permanent, we want to have a little bit more warmth into these colors. So back to the alizarin crimson permanent into the middle. Here we have the frontal region of the skull, a very definitive plane change right around here. As we work our way across towards the uh, parietal region of the skull, so the little parietal is going to be on the side. And now we're on the top of the skull, so we're really trying to figure out the plane changes with respect to the uh, anatomical knowledge. And it's a good idea to keep your phone around and uh, Google exactly what the plane changes are, because I certainly don't know all of them by heart. I do know about the frontal ridge and the front of the skull, because I say that often in my videos. But the parietal is really something that I don't usually see but the parietal bone, that, that plane change, is very clear to see as it rolls across, across the side of the temple. Here's the little temple region across the side of the eye socket. We're really trying to punch up that light there. So now let's get a little bit of cadmium red and some of our zinc white in the middle region of the palette. This plane right here is for the frontalis muscle. So this is the frontalis muscle of the head. You can see that very clear and distinct plane change. And uh, it's important to know these uh, the names of these plane changes, these uh, anatomical uh, regions, whether it's a uh, muscle change or whether it's a uh, cha plane change because of the bony structure. It's important to at least have a, a slight understanding or a moderate understanding of it. I certainly am not an anatomist, so I have to keep uh, looking up what these terms are. And now we're painting, in, again, a little plane change here for the parietal uh, region of the skull. Now we have a little more of an accent there. I keep moving back and forth between the parietal and the side of the eye socket because those plane changes are, I don't know, I'm trying to get a relation between the plane change of the side of the eye socket and the parietal. 
here we have a very distinct light here for the nasal bone. Remember the nasal bone is really the start of the nose as, as it works its way around towards the bottom of the nose. So I'm working all of these shapes together, trying to make them more accurate as I go. And now we're using a little bit more of our alizarin permanent with our uh, zinc white. So just alizarin permanent, zinc white, trying to get a red-ish color here for the side of the nose as it approaches the maxilla region of the skull. All right, so now let's get into a different little brush. So this is actually a fairly worn down uh, size, I believe size two round brush. And now you can tell that we're moving, uh, we're getting smaller and smaller with the size of the brush here. So this is actually a size four filbert. Remember we started off with those uh, size six flat bristle brushes. So now this is even a, I believe it's a size two round brush and this is pro this has probably been uh, my most favorite brush though it's uh, kind of approaching the end of its life i still really love using this brush the size one round brush it's the green brush and in the description box below i'll uh, list it as the green brush so you'll know which brush I'm talking about again I'll type that in the description box below so now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, push that value transition for the side of the eye socket to the left of your screen a little bit darker and also follow through with the shadow for the bottom of the ear making that shape a little bit darker now we're working our way up to the earlobe so that is the plane change for the earlobe let's mix a little bit more light right around here and so I'm trying to get the contrast between uh, middle tones and the the light values so I can get the uh, effect of the ear to read at a distance. And now I'm going to switch and paint in this little dark shape here. And this is going to be for the, the little shape, the little hook looking shape there. And that's for the tragus of the ear. So that's the little little loop there for the tragus of the ear. I'm just going to flatten that entire thing out and come back to it later. So I'm going to think about the ear as a simplified uh, mass of color right now. You can see the very uh, simple masses that we painted in there. And here we're going to start to paint some light around the helix of the ear. Just a little touch of light for the helix. Now let's get to some darker darks from the middle region of the palette. And let's paint in that little uh, dark light or that little half tone, sorry, for the back side of the anti-helix. So you can kind of tell the gradation from the brushes. So we started off with the uh, size six filbert flat bristle brushes. Then we moved on to the size four filbert brushes. And now we're kind of using some size two round brushes. And then we'll get into some even tinier brushes. And you don't always have to work that way. Sometimes I just stick with the size 2 brush and just look at each little section at a time and that can be very relaxing. Uh, but for this video, we're really trying to show the progression. I'm really trying to show the progression between those larger brushes to the smaller brushes. And I'm not really counting the first brush, the drawing brush, as part of this. Remember I started off with a burnt umber drawing with a size two drawing brush. I, I don't really count that brush. That was more for the drawing. So now we have a little plane change there for the uh, mustache, for the facial hair. And so that's a local value change. It's not a change because the plane is angling away. Rather, it's a, it's a darker value because the mustache is darker. And now we're working our way across the side of the orbicularis oris, approaching the maxilla region of the bone. A very distinct plane change for that. And let's add a little bit of light there. There's a little bit of light catching the bottom lip as that plane angles uh, closer to the light. So a very simple brush stroke for that, for the light of the lip. And now as I'm using the smaller brushes, I'm actually uh, introducing a little bit of medium to the uh, paint. And I'm actually using a slow drying medium uh, for these uh, passages of paint and I'm using a medium a different one so I'm using a uh, one produced by Gamblin so it's called solvent free fluid and it's a very um, it's not very thick it's not as thick as stand oil but 
it's still a slow dryer and it allows me to work for several hours at a time. And again, the, the only reason I have that medium, it was on sale. I think I got it for like two ninety nine. So yeah, that's why I have that slow dryer. Now I'm going to paint in a little plain change here for the right side of the uh, eye socket here to the right of your screen. So his eye socket to the right of your screen. So there's a little distinct plane change there. And there's even some uh, medium on this brush now. So I tell you what, I tend to use more medium for the uh, later stages of the painting. And that uh, it kind of just, it's a little easier painting uh, with thinner paint over top of thicker paint. It gives it that type of feeling like you're painting over top of a painting that's already dry, but still a little malleable too, so it's very nice. And at this point, the oil paint really feels like I'm working with uh, kind of the consistency of butter. Pretty much like the, I can't believe it's not butter in the microwave for just maybe uh, two or three seconds, maybe four and a half seconds, until you get that nice consistency and a nice little creaminess as the painting or as the paint uh, fits onto these shapes very uh, nicely and very smooth. This is also how we're going to create smooth transitions. Notice how smooth the plane is on the top of the nose. That area is really smooth because we applied thinner paint over top of the thicker paint to create a very nice and uh, smooth transition. And now we have this little light corner on the side of the wing of the nose. So this is a plane that's angled closer to the light, but it's also in contrast to the uh, plane change for the wing of the nose. Now let's follow through to the other side, to the other wing. So the wing of the nose to the left of your screen. So we painted in a much darker shape in there. Let's go back to the brush that we used for the background and uh, just carve that in a little bit because it went a little too far out and that's okay. And now we're gonna go back to the middle region of the palette and let's go back to the uh, side of the zygomatic bone. So there you have the cheekbone. It's actually a little bit darker there as it approaches the, the side of the temporal region of the skull. Now we're moving our way to the parietal. So here we're back to the parietal region and notice how we're starting to make the transitions more smooth and that's and we're achieving the smooth transitions by applying thinner paint over top of the thicker paint so that's how we're going to be using the medium here to create these transitions now we're working our way around the helix of the ear again just kind of moving uh, throughout the picture here's the little cast shadow from the corner of the helix of the ear Let's add a little bit more white here uh, for this little highlight just on the side of the anti-helix. Now let's paint in the darker little shape here for the back side of the skull. And remember this little shape here for the back of the skull is very important. This little angle right here on the contour of the side of the skull. You really want to make sure that you place that angle down. If you don't place that angle down, you will lose part of the backside of the skull. And believe me, I've done that enough times to know it's it's not fun to lose the side of the skull. Now we're painting in the smooth little transition here as the uh, planes wrap around the side of the parietal. All right, now we're just going to go ahead and create a little more of a uh, intricate plane change but very mindful right there this shape right here gotta make sure that that shape remains evident because that's the shape for the back side of the skull all right back to the cadmium red with the zinc white and uh, a tiny bit of the sap green just to neutralize the colors and even a little bit more burnt umber just to neutralize a little bit more. Now let's paint in this little side plane here for the uh, zygomaticus region of the face. So this is the side plane of the face. You can very cleanly see, you can see how cleanly divided these planes are for the side of the face. And we're gonna go in and add more plane changes for the side of the face. But then at the end, we're gonna come back with a uh, soft brush and just smoothen out those transitions or should I say make those transitions more soft so 
a little more sap green and let's paint in a very cool accent a very a much cooler note so it's going to be sap green and the zinc white because this little plane change is actually a little bit cooler and now let's go back to the lighter region of the palette with a little more of our uh, zinc white and let's place in the highlight right here for the plane of the cheekbone that is most facing uh, to the light source. Now let's get into some smaller shapes here. So now we're really with the small brushes. So this is a size zero round brush and we're going to just very cleanly uh, discern the corner of the side of the wing of the nose and distinguish that from the side of the orbicularis oris, the side of the uh, structure that is containing the mouth. Notice a very clean and sharp edge right there. I don't want to make all the edges the same degree of sharpness, but th this edge is going to be fairly sharp. And that is just because um, it's going to provide some focus towards the center of the face, right about the, this little shape right here, just trying to uh, carve that out as accurately as I can. Now let's move down across towards the uh, finger. So let's go ahead and distinguish this little shape here for the thumb. So let's cut across right here. Let's see. I think I want the thumb to have a few more straight lines just so it looks a little bit more solid. So let's carve all the way down here. So now as you notice uh, we're trying to uh, create a very uh, finished outline now for the side of the face trying to be as specific as possible so that's why we're using this tiny little brush to help us have more control remember smaller brushes enable you to have more control but they do slow down uh, the amount that you cover on the surface now let's go ahead and push this shape for the nose a little bit further out and now we're going to uh, just look at this uh, turning plane here. And as I create these uh, subtle transitions, remember the word subtlety just means uh, how close can you get these values to one another uh, without losing the distinction between the values. So that's how you create subtlety is by having the values very close to one another yet still differentiated. And now we're just going to go in again with the uh, side of the nose. Now the nose could be uh, perhaps a tiny bit uh, too long, but that's all right. I'm not trying to create a perfect uh, photographic image of the model. Rather, I'm trying to create a painting. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the edge right here between the side of the wing of the nose and the maxilla region of the face. Now this paint brush is loaded with a little more medium uh, than the other uh, applications of paint and that is again notice how the paint is really nicely sticking onto the surface and that is because it's a soft brush and it has quite a bit of medium to it. Now I'm going to be looking at this little plane here. This plane is actually picking up more light and that is the bottom. Uh, that is the bottom of the root of the nose. And now we have a little uh, highlight here for the bulb of the nose. And now let's go ahead with the same uh, flesh tone combinations from the middle of the palette. And let's just go in and soften a few of these little uh, transitions here. So let's let's bridge the gap between the side plane of the nose and the maxilla region of the face, right about there. Now let's go ahead and just uh, paint in a little intermediate plane change for uh, this little shape here as we roll our way across the side of the maxilla region of the face towards the zygomatic region, that is towards the uh, cheekbone region. And let's just soften that little area right there. You can very uh, clean, you can see how clean these plane changes are and it really does help to uh, create the illusion of form at a distance. And now we're going to go in and add a little bit of a uh, softer edge here between the shape of the mustache and the bottom of the wing of the nose. Just trying to make that edge very soft. 
and let's just put in a little more pink so we have a tiny bit more of the cadmium red into the mixture there for that area now let's go ahead and soften this transition a little bit with an intermediate value change so I mixed up an, or I just basically took from a, the palette a value that was right in between the light shape and the dark shape on the side of the zygomatic bone and you can even tell how the shape of that value kind of mimics the zygomatic region of the face and now we're working our way up towards the top of the cheekbone just making the transitions much more smooth as we go and remember we started off with uh, bristle brushes large bristle brushes and now we've worked our way towards smaller synthetic brushes smaller synthetic round brushes and I like using round brushes for the smaller shapes because I can uh, I can use the round brush very much like a sharpened pencil point and now let's go in and uh, let's look at this little bottom shape for the lower lip. Let's just carve out that shape right there as it turns around the back side of the lower lip. And let's look at the bottom side of the lip right about here. And let's make sure that we leave the light that's showing on the bottom of the lip. Very simple little touches here. Now let's put in that little dark accent for the bottom of the lip and let's let some of these brush strokes show so I'm not going to make everything as uh, smooth I'm going to let some brush strokes show in some areas so now let's go into the finger now we're going to articulate some more plane changes for the finger now we have a little bit of a cadmium red taken from the middle region of the palette and now we're going to look at the little plane change for the bottom of the finger so there's a little distinct plane change right about there. So that's a half tone taken again directly from the palette. And the color combinations are no more complicated than what you saw before. So basically a combination of our cadmium red, yellow ochre, zinc white, burnt umber, maybe a little bit of sap green and alizarin, maybe a touch of alizarin for these colors. Not very complicated, but what is important is that these values are working in relation to one another so let's look at the value for the back side of the uh, neck that value is darker than the overall average value of the finger so we have to work that uh, relationship out now we have the little top of the knuckle here so this little knuckle shape is going to have a little more uh, pink in it so we throw in a little more of the cadmium red into that shape and even a little bit more cadmium red for the little shape for the knuckle. Now let's look at some of the really tiny shapes. So again, we're using a size zero round brush and we're going to be painting in the little bit of light that we see there for the bottom of the wing of the nose. And now we're going to look at the uh, cast shadow on the side of the wing of the nose. And remember, large brushes are very useful for covering a lot of surface area very quickly and easily. Uh, but when it comes down to control, these little tiny brushes really give you the most control. And it's very similar to working with a sharpened graphite pencil. And that's why, again, I like to use little tiny size one round brushes for these tiny little shapes because it really does give you the most control when it comes to articulating individual tiny little plane changes. And now here we have the accent uh, for the nostril and this value here is very dark. It's very much just burnt umber ivory black and a tiny bit of alizarin crimson. Remember it's nice to sneak in a tad bit of warmth in between your dark accents and now we're going to put in a very tiny little plane change here but it still needs to be distinct a very clean and distinct little plane change there as the bulb of the nose wraps its way around uh, the wing of the nose and creates the little fold there for the nostril and now we're going to just look at the uh, little curve here that the nostril is making remember the nostrils also kind of part of the outline 
for the wing of the nose itself. So it does need to be studied with a tad bit of specificity as well. And now let's go ahead and add a little bit more light here for the uh, top of the bulb of the nose here. We're going to be working this little passage of light around uh, the bulb of the nose. So again, just zinc white and some of the flesh tones taken right off of the palette. Nothing terribly complicated with these color combinations. And let's go ahead and just make sure that we make this little area smooth around the bottom of the bulb of the nose, but let's let the brush stroke show here for the highlight of the nose. So let's just let that brush stroke show. All right, now let's go in with the little soft brush as promised and make these little transitions here very soft. So this is very much like finishing a sculpture you'd imagine, sculpting out all of those tiny little plane changes and at the end going in and uh, making them smoother and smoother kind of like you would imagine a uh, marble sculpture you chip out all the planes and then come back in with maybe some sandpaper or uh, or whatever kind of surface you'd use and just make the transitions very smooth no notice this transition here I just want to make it a smooth transition again I don't want to make everything smooth and with that we have the conclusion of this portrait painting demonstration. Thank you so much for watching. I really do hope that these videos help you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork and I'll see you on the next one.